BGMC. The biblical truth lives here. scriptures foretold of the anointed one, Yeshua HaMashiach. The Messiah Yeshua came to call the people back to the truth of His word and to follow that righteous path. Yeshua then called Jewish men to be His disciples, and after His death and resurrection, those Jewish men told the world about the Jewish Messiah. Now, after 2,000 years, Beth Goyim Messianic Congregation has that same calling of those Jewish men telling all people, both Jew and Gentile, about the proper ancient path, teaching the Route 66 King's Highway from Genesis through to Revelation, and how you need and can get back to the proper roots of the faith and a closer walk with God. Now, let's hear the message. Let's go get a blessing. Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 15. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 22 to 28. I'm sorry there will be no translation today because none of the translators are here. Okay, 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 22 to 28. Let's go on to the next slide. This is Messianic lesson number 970. It is entitled, Turning Back to God. What does that biblically mean? The Pilgrim's Covenant. Messianic lesson number 970. It is entitled, Turning Back to God. <clears throat> what does that biblically mean? The Pilgrim's Covenant. Let's go on to the slide where it has a synopsis. Uh, as I said, there will be no translation today. I'm sorry for that, but I can only do so much. Synopsis. The Word of God is perfect. And it gives life. Today we are going to study what happens to nations who refuse to yield to Jehovah. We are going to study what turning back to God means. We are going to look at the Pilgrim's Covenant. We are going to see if Jehovah is a hypocrite or not. Get ready. We're going on a deep dive. So if you don't want to hear the biblical truth, turn off and turn and tune out. Let's go on to the slide that has the English for synopsis. Hashabbat lesson. You'll be driven out. We're going to start off in 1 Shmuel, 1 Samuel chapter 15. We're going to take a look at verse 22 to 28. What is better? Then we're going to Divarim, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 11 through 15. Nothing is impossible. 1 Shmuel Samuel, chapter 15, verses 24 to 28. Devarim, Deuteronomy, chapter 9, verse 1 through 5. It is because these nations have been so wicked. Devarim, Deuteronomy, chapter 12, verse 29 through 31. You must not do this to Jehovah your Elohim. And we're going to Metiahu, Matthew, chapter 16, verse 18. The covenant. Then we're going to Devarim, Deuteronomy again, chapter 9, verse 4 and 5. He is not a hypocrite. Okay, so let's uh, go to that first Samuel scripture. Let me just uh, set this computer up over here. First Samuel, first Shmuel chapter 15, please. First Samuel chapter 15. We're going to look at verse 22 to 28. Okay, I'll try to keep the pace. Not too quick, you know, I'm used to doing with translation. So if I'm going too, too fast or too slow, let me know. Okay, 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22 to 28. Shmuel said, Does Jehovah take as much pleasure in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying what Jehovah says? Surely obeying is better than sacrifice, and heeding orders than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of sorcery, 
stubbornness like the crime of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of Jehovah, he too has rejected you as king. Shaul said to Shmuel, I have sinned. I have violated the order of Jehovah and your words too, because I was afraid of the people and listened to what they said. Now, please pardon my sin and come back with me so I can worship Jehovah. But Shmuel said to Shaul, I will not go back with you because you have rejected the word of Jehovah. And Jehovah has rejected you as king over Israel. As Shmuel was turning around to leave, he took hold of the hem of his cloak and it tore. Shmuel said to him, Jehovah has torn the kingdom of Israel away from you today and given it to a fellow countryman of yours who is better than you. Amen? As I said before, I've been trying to... This, this thing has been on my spirit for a couple of weeks. This, uh, what we're going to be talking about in covenants and coming back to the Lord and what it really means to go, go back to God. But each week, you know, for the last at least two weeks, Jehovah has stopped me from giving this lesson. Because, uh, there, I mean, he has his reasons, and we're going to try to look at some of those reasons today. But today, uh, we're going to go through what it means to turn back to God. Okay? There's many writers out there, such as John Kahn, who writes books, you know, all these mysteries and stuff, and he never tells you what it means to turn back to God. I was uh, listening to Real America's Voice, okay, and Charlie Kirk, and he had some pastors on on Thanksgiving, and uh, they were talking about there's a split in the evangelical church, and some of us, you know, bring the truth, you know, they were talking all about homosexuality, which is against God's law, but they weren't going deeper. They, they, you know. You can preach against homosexuality because that is a sin in the Bible. It is in Leviticus 18 and Romans chapter 1 and Revelation 22. But if you're doing other things against that, that you're a hypocrite. And we're going to go through what it means to turn back to God. Then uh, many people know Glenn Beck. And he, he gave a whole thing the other day about wanting to make a covenant and turning back to God. Okay, and th then there's teachers like I saw last night. Jim Staley is back on, and he's you know teaching you know the real truth, passion for truth, and we'll go through some of the things he said with the scriptures, and to see if that really is correct. I mean, can you be partially pregnant? Okay, all right, so. Let's let's take you know now this I've been trying to get through to, to a couple of weeks as I said so now we're going to be talking about covenants we're going to be talking about history we're going to be talking about the word of God and we're going to go through what God says in His Word for us and what what does it really mean biblically to turn back to God okay first Shmuel first Samuel fifteen verses twenty two and twenty three okay. Shmuel said, does Jehovah take as much pleasure in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying what Jehovah says? Surely obeying is better than sacrificing, or sacrifice and heeding orders than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of sorcery, stubbornness like the crime of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of Jehovah, he too has rejected you as king. Amen? So, if you haven't underlined those two verses in your Bible, I, I think you should, memorize, you should memorize them and definitely have them underlined in your Bible. Because uh, if you wanted to summarize the whole Bible, if you wanted two verses that summarize actually from Genesis through to the book of Revelation, it's these two verses. All right? Let's read those two verses again because it really does summarize the whole Bible. Shmuel said, does Jehovah take as much pleasure in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying what Jehovah says? 
Surely obeying is better than sacrificing, and heeding orders than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of sorcery, stubbornness like the crime of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of Jehovah, he too has rejected you as king. And, amen? So really what you see in those two verses is a summary of the whole Bible. Okay? You know, so let's ask the question. Let's write this for our, our notes, for the very first note. What does it mean to turn back to Jehovah? What does it mean to turn back to Jehovah? What does it mean to turn back to Jehovah? We're going to get the real answer today because here at Beth I don't, I've, we don't play with the Word of God. We don't water it down. I'm not here to make friends with you. I'm here to, to worship my God. Okay, That's who's, who matters. You know, it talks about in Romans, you know, if one day is special to somebody, let that day be special to them. God does not care about your opinion. When you get up to heaven, it's not a democracy. Heaven is a monarchy. And yes, Jehovah loves us. That's the Father. That's his eternal name. Okay. Yes, he loves us. He sent his son to die for us. But the only opinion that, matter, that matters in heaven is the Father's, okay? Because when you have another opinion, such as Lucifer did, right? Lucifer had another opinion, correct? And where did he end up? He ended up a Democrat, okay? <laughs> okay. Uh, so, verse 22 and 23 summarize the whole Bible. So what does it mean to turn back to Jehovah, okay? Let's take a look at something here. Adam and Chava, they were living under grace, correct? Because the, the, the whole Torah had not been given to them. What the, people, what the world thinks is grace, right? So they were living under grace. Uh, and they had only one rule to follow. One commandment was given. Okay, And what most people don't realize, and they, they don't really look at it, you know, they say, they're not to eat from the tree. The first law ever given is a kosher law. God said, don't eat that. Okay? We don't have to know why. We're not going to go into that today. He just said, don't eat that. The commandment was given to his creation, to his children. And, he, and you know, really understand that that the very first thing that Jehovah said to humans is don't eat from that tree. The first thing he's going to talk about is kosher. Okay? To, to us humans, the first thing he talks about to Adam, who then told it to his wife, was a kosher law. So you need to put that in your spirit. That the, ver the very first commandment the Lord ever gave was something that we're not supposed to do, we're not just supposed to put that in our body. He didn't say anything about touching it, looking at it. He just said, don't eat from that tree. Okay? So, when, the, when we're turning back to Jehovah, we need to take everything into account of what he said. And he said, that tree that we're not supposed to eat from, that's not food for you. All right, so write that down. Write your next note down. The first law was a kosher law. The first law is a kosher law. The first law is a kosher law. And what does that mean? That means there are things we can eat and things we can't eat. Okay? What is food and what is not food? That's, the, that's what a kosher law is. It's God saying, this is not food for you. Okay, if you want to be his children, he's saying, this is not food for you. All the other trees are food for you. Okay, in the garden, there were many trees, right? It says there were many trees. Okay, and he said, of all those, you can eat. So, you know, 
It doesn't list what fruits are in there, but, you know, I would think bananas. Everybody, right? Does everybody agree that there's bananas in the garden? I mean, we can't prove it, but I think there's, you know, peaches, you know, oranges. All you know, pineapple doesn't grow on a tree. I mean, there's, there's all these different things that you could eat from. <clears throat> but what he said, this one is not for you. That's a real big concept that we need to understand. All the other trees are food, but this is not food for you. Okay? And it was that he was separating that to say this is not food for you. Okay? And if those two people would have been obedient, okay, let's think of that for a second. If Adam and Chava, that's Adam and Eve, if those people would have been obedient to the one law, we would not be here talking. You, you realize that? So when turning back to God, we need to go back to following what the Father said. So let's write that for our notes. When turning back to God, we need to follow what he says. When turning back to God, we need to follow what he says. When turning back to God, we need to follow what he says. Okay, it's, you know, I might do a lot of notes for us today because, as I said, there's a lot of Christians out there. Charlie Kirk had, I think, three pastors on on, on Thanksgiving. Uh, Glenn Beck had, has a million followers on YouTube. Okay, there's John Kahn is writing books and books and more books. Okay, but nobody is telling you what does it biblically mean to turn back to God. So turning back to God means following what he said. Okay? And if Adam and Chava had done that, we would not be here. We'd still be in heaven. Wouldn't you like to be in heaven? You know, I think that's a pretty good place. It's a good neighborhood. No crime. Streets of gold. You know, living water. 2.0 body. Yeah. You know, a diamond fence, no, a, a pearl for the door. You know, imagine the size of that clam. <laughs> you know, so if Adam and Chava, Adam and Eve, had just listened to one rule, we wouldn't have to be here going through what we're going to have to go through. Now look at verse 22 and 23 again. 1 Samuel 15, verse 22 and 23. Shmuel said, does Jehovah take as much pleasure in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying what Jehovah says? Surely obeying is better than sacrificing, a sacrifice, and heeding orders than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of sorcery, stubbornness like the crime of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of Jehovah, he too has rejected you, you, rejected you as king. Amen? So in verse 23, Shmuel gives some really good examples of what it means to not follow the word of God. It says in verse 23, rebellion against heaven's, heaven's laws is sorcery. Okay? Rebellion against heaven's law is like sorcery. It's you know, really good examples. I really liked uh, Shmuel, okay? And you know, even when uh, later on, and when, when uh, Shaul wakes him up from sleeping, he's like, why did you wake me? <laughs> Everybody read that part? You know, and when, when Shaul's looking for, uh, uh, you know, he goes to, the, to the, the witch and he conjures up Shmuel and he says, why did you wake me? Okay, in verse 23, we're going to look at the definition of what the word sorcery means. So in verse 23, we have the word sorcery. In some of your translations, it's the word divination. And it's H7081. The, the Hebrew word is kasem. It means, number one, divination, witchcraft. Number two, of the nation, of the nations, the Lam. Number three, of false prophets. So let's go look at, let's discuss 
definition number two for a moment. Of the nations. Belong. Okay? When you reject the word of God, you are like Balaam. Okay? You're, and that's not going to be very good for you. Okay? When anyone rejects or rebels against heaven's law to Elohim, it's like worshiping another God. All right, so now that I fixed my error, with, and you can have the slides on the internet for sorcery and divination. So let's go, let's see what sorcery and divination, because we don't want to miss uh, all the, uh, what you see up on the screen is from our good friend Ben. He helps out with the PowerPoint. So thank you, Mr. Ben. And you're in your, the holy land of Florida. All right, so sorcery and divination is H7081, Kasem, means divination, witchcraft. Number two of the nations, Balaam. Number three of false prophets. So let's take a look at number, definition number two, because what we're talking about now is turning back to God, what it means biblically. Okay, so in uh, 1 Samuel 15, uh, Shmuel said it was like rebellion is like the sin of sorcery. So what is sorcery? Okay, when you rebel against heaven's laws to Elohim, it's like you're a sorcerer. It's like you're worshiping another god. Because our, our Father in heaven, Jehovah Elohim, okay, doesn't want you worshiping another god, right? He says in the second commandment, you should have no other gods beside my face. Don't put anything next to him. All right, so when you are not listening to God's laws, heaven's laws, you are like a sorcerer. You are a demon. You are worshiping another god. Okay? If you're, and basically, you're worshiping the devil himself. When you don't want to, you know, uh, like what we were talking about, Adam and Chava, right? They listened to the devil when he said, surely you won't die. So they were worshiping him instead of worshiping Jehovah, the Father, who said, don't eat that. That's not food for you. So instead, they were worshiping another god. They're worshiping the devil. So if you are not listening to the commandments of, the, of God the Father, Jehovah, okay, which his son kept the commandments, and we are to follow Yeshua, our Messiah's example, okay, then let's look at definition number one. Sorcery is like divination and witchcraft. Okay, so how many people think people like that do the stuff that Harry Potter does, you know, in the books, which is real, witchcraft is real, okay? How many people think that those people are going to get into heaven? You're not going to get into heaven, okay? When I was a pagan, I delved into that area, okay? And it's real. Witchcraft is real, everybody. And you can, you can redeem yourself. You can turn from witchcraft, you can turn from devil worship, okay? There's only one sin that's not forgivable. That's blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, okay? And what is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? Hmm, that would be not following God's commandments. Because what did Yeshua say? The Father will send the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, to remind you about everything he said, okay? And what is Yeshua's titles. He's the word of God. Okay? So divination, sorcery is like the div divination or witchcraft. It's like casting spells. Witches cast spells. Okay? Oh, well, they only do white magic. Okay? There's no difference between casting spell and white magic and casting spell and black magic. It's, it's not racist. It's just it's magic. It's casting spells over somebody. It's following the darkness. It's not following the light. It's following the darkness. Right, so if you're part of that world, you're not part of God's world. Okay? And God does not want you doing those things. But you have a choice. He gives us freedom of choice. Let's write that for our notes. Following God gives us freedom of choice. Following God gives us freedom of choice choice. Following God gives us freedom of choice, okay? So what does turning back to God? Not going to witches. Not being part of that world anymore. 
not going into that world. Okay, reading your horoscope. You know, did, did anybody used to read your horoscope and stuff like that, or still read your horoscope? That would be doing things that is against the word of God. We're not to look to that. We're not to follow that. That's at, that's against the word of God. Okay, so it's like casting spells. Okay, what is uh, what is witchcraft or divination? It's like being a friend of the world. Okay, can you be a friend of the world and a friend of God? Well, in James chapter four verse four, this is a a reference. In James four four, he says you can't love the loving the world is hating God. Whoever chooses to be the world's friend makes himself God's enemy. So you can't be a friend of the world, okay? You can't desire those things. You can't do those things, okay? The, the best thing that, that anybody could ever, the best question anybody could ever ask is what would Yeshua do? Let's write that for our notes. The best question you can ask is what would Yeshua do? Best question you could ask is, what would Yeshua do? Last time, the best question for you to ask is, what would Yeshua do? Okay? Because Yeshua said what? Nobody gets to the Father except through him. So if you're doing things that Messiah did not do, did not say to do, did not give you an example to do, then you are not going to get to the Father. Okay, so turning back to God means following Yeshua's example. Okay, because you can't be a friend of the world and a friend of God. Okay, it's a choice that you're going to have to make. That's that's the other key, people, is that you make choices in your life to follow God or not to follow God. He's not going to force you to do that. You can be a friend of man, okay? You can trust in man's ways, or you can trust in God's ways. You can't have it both ways, okay? And many people trust in man more. You know, why would God kill, allow that baby to die? Because they made a choice, as we learned last week. You know, that baby dying brought the two parents to believing in God because they saw such evil. And that was last week's lesson. So, God has, God didn't force. Now think of this for a second. Let me slow down a second. Did God put a fence around that tree of knowledge? No. Did God put an angel to guard that tree of knowledge at first? No. He just said to his creation, to Adam, and Adam said to Chava, don't eat that. He didn't say anything else. He said, don't eat from that tree. You're going to have to make the choice. And that's what turning back to God means. Turning back to God means making a choice to follow his word from Genesis through to the book of Revelation. It's all or nothing. That's the kind of God we serve. You can't be a little pregnant. You can't be a little married. Can you be a little bit married, everybody? What would, what would your wife think, Kurt, if you were just a little married? Just go to, just go to sleep. Mm-hmm. Raphael, what do you think your, your beloved next to you would think if you were a little, if you said you were just a little married? <laughs> I don't think she would care for that, right? Okay, so you can't be a friend of the world because many of the people of the world, you know, when they first get married, oh, this is my starter marriage. What? It's my, yeah, this one's only going to last a couple of years. No. I, I guess I'm still on my starter marriage. You've been with the same woman for now, married 36 years, together 38. You know, so you can't be a friend of the world and a friend of God, says James. Now, the other key to turning back to God is, is this. 
there are two keys that we need to look at. And that's what Gami Khan doesn't understand. That's what uh, the guy from Real America's Voice didn't understand. That's what Glenn Beck doesn't understand. And this is what Jim Stelly doesn't understand. There's two scriptures, or two verses in the Bible. Malachi 3.6. Jehovah says, I don't change. He doesn't change. He said it himself in Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. And for the people on the other half of the book, in Hebrews 13.8, what does it say? Messiah is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You know, that's what we need to understand. If Turning back to God means that you realize that the Father doesn't change, the Son doesn't change. And we, in this nation, were dedicated to God. And we're far from what those people dedicated it, this land to. And we're going to get into some other stuff later. I'm going to lay it out, but we've got to lay down our foundation first. Okay? So Samuel says, rebellion is like the sin of sorcery. And sorcery is like divination or witchcraft. Okay, so if you if you don't believe God the God the Father, Jehovah is the same yesterday, today, and forever, what he said in Malachi 3 6. He said, I don't change. And it says in Hebrews 13, 8, that Yeshua is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Okay? Though our, our Messiah doesn't change. He's not going to change what he does for your opinion. Does he love us? He died for us. He loves us. You know, how much does Yeshua love us? This much. Okay, he died so much. He loved us so much, he allowed himself to be killed so that we could live. Okay? So, if they're the same yesterday, today, and forever, and if we rebel against heaven's laws, then it's like us practicing witchcraft. If you say that you can eat anything you want, then you're rebelling against Leviticus chapter 11, and you're rebelling, and what does rebelling mean? What did we just... That's like sorcery, right? And sorcery is like witchcraft. Okay, so now let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 15. We're going to look at verse 22 and 23 again. Shmuel said, Does Jehovah take as much pleasure in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying what Jehovah says? Surely obeying obeying is better than sacrifice, and heeding orders than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of sorcery. Stubbornness is like the crime of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of Jehovah, he too has rejected you as king. Amen? If all people would have done what it said in verse 22, there would be no need for Yeshua to die. Okay? In verse 22, if we would just do what God said, there would be no need for any sacrifices. Okay, unless you're, you're giving a thanks offering. You can give a thanks offering, a praise offering. But if you just do what God says, you don't need to sacrifice, except for your first fruit offering, you know, the bikarim offering, the bread offering for, for Shavuot. Okay, if we would just do what God says, then there are no need for offerings. Now, also think of this. If all of us did what it said in verse 22, then Yeshua, our Messiah, didn't have to come and die. Do you understand that? That if we just did what God said, the Father said, Yeshua would not have to have come 
and died. If we were just doing what the Father said for us to do, you know, Yeshua wouldn't, wouldn't have died. There would be no need for sacrifices. Okay? If we had just kept our part of the covenant, there would not have been a need for sacrifice. Isn't that something, isn't that something to really think about? That if we just kept our end of the covenant, there wouldn't need to be sacrifices. Yeshua wouldn't have had to come from heaven. If we just did, if Adam and Chava just did what the Father had asked them to do, instead of worshiping Satan, if they just listened, okay, they didn't even have to praise the Lord. If they just listened to what he asked them to do, there would have been no need for sacrifices. Okay? And, you know, I wrote this earlier in the day, and then I saw it on, on what, last night. I was scouring YouTube for teaching to see what's out there. I wrote this. I said, I know that there's people out there that have been lied to because they say nobody could keep the law. You know what? That's what Jim Staley said last night. Nobody could keep the law. Is that biblical? Well, hold your place in 1 Samuel, and let's turn over to Deuteronomy, Divarim, chapter 30, verse 11 through 15. Let's see if Jimmy Boy is correct, that nobody could keep the law. Deuteronomy, hold your place in 1 Shmuel, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 11 through 15. Turning back to God means this. For the mitzvah which I'm giving you today is not too hard for you. It is not beyond your reach. It isn't in the sky so that you need to ask, who will go up into the sky for us, bring it to us and make us hear it so that we can obey it? Likewise, it isn't beyond the sea so that you need to ask, who will cross the sea for us, bring it to us and make us hear it? so that we can obey it. On the contrary, the word is very close to you, in your mouth, even in your heart. Therefore, you can do it. Look, I am presenting you today with, on one hand, life and good, and on the other hand, death and evil. Amen? So, if Elohim does not change, then this covenant that is shown to us is not too hard, correct? Okay, look at verse 11. For the mitzvah which I'm giving you today is not too hard for you. It is not beyond your reach. So what I watched last night with Jim Staley, he was 100% wrong because he said, we can't keep the law. But verse 11 says, you can keep the law. Okay, has anybody? No. Because Jehovah said, what's in our heart? Evil is in our heart. Our hearts are continually evil. But it doesn't mean that you can't do it because he said in verse 11, you know, think of this for one second. Would the Father really give you something that he knew you couldn't do? Think of that. Wouldn't that have been ob- obnoxious? Yeah, let's make laws so they can't do it. That's what I want for my kids. Yep, yep. I, I, I want to give them laws so hard that they, they, they can't do it. That's, I want to see my child fail. That's, uh, that's, that's something really good. Yep, yep, that's what I want to do. Yep, 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 yep. That's, a, that's what every father wants. I want to make life so hard that my son wants to commit suicide. Uh, you know, he can't do the law. No, that's a lie from the enemy. Because right there it's very clear. Verse 11. For the mitzvah which I'm giving you today is not too hard for you. It is not beyond your reach. Okay? We just don't want to try. You know, we, you know, if you think something is too hard, you're going to fail. Okay? Oh, I can't do that. It's going to be too hard. We can't do that. If that's your attitude, then you will fail. Okay? But if you say, I can do all things through Yeshua who strengthens me, 
Is it, isn't that like somewhere in Ephesians or something like that? I can do all things through Yeshua, Jesus who strengthens me. Okay? The church is always saying that. And, but they're saying that they can't follow the law. And this is what Staley said last night. You know, a third into his lesson. Okay? What does, what does turning back to God mean? It means, verse 11, it's not too hard for you. To follow God's commandments, it's not too hard for you. It's an attitude problem. Okay? Well, I, I like fornicating. I like uh, you know, watching dirty movies. I like watching war movies. I, I like drinking. I like getting drunk. I like getting high. I like driving fast. You know, that's, that's your choice. It's your choice. But it doesn't mean that you can't make a choice to want to follow God. And right here in verse 11, it's not too hard for you. It's an attitude problem. You know, keeping heaven's law, the mitzvot, is not too hard. It's what you desire. I've seen people work so hard for a home, a new car. I've seen men do things for wanting to get this woman, this girl. I've seen people work very hard to get a position. I've seen people work hard to get a, a degree. It's an attitude problem. It's what you want. But we're being told in verse 11, it's not too hard for you. Okay, <laughs> Keeping the covenant with Elohim can be done. Let's write that for our notes. Keeping the covenant with Elohim can be done. Keeping the covenant with Elohim can be done. And for those who are new, Elohim is the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. One more time, keeping the covenant with Elohim can be done. Okay, Because verse 11 says it can be done. Does God change? Malachi 3.6 says no, right? Does Yeshua change? Hebrews 13.8 says no. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Okay, so keeping the covenant with Elohim can be done. The reason we're talking about this before we get to the history lesson is the pilgrims, the separatists, were hit with many challenges before they sailed here. And even while sa sailing here, the masts of the Mayflower broke. And they were going to turn back. But they decided to go on. They wanted to walk with God so badly and to worship Him the way He wanted them to worship Him. They were willing to put everything on the line. Okay? So we're going to get to the history of them earlier uh, in, a, in a little while, but we need to lay down this foundation first of the Word of God. Because then when you look at history and you see people really going that extra, extra mile, maybe that might put a fire in you to say, I can do it, instead of listening to these, you know, like Staley last night. Nobody can keep the law. Well, my Bible says I can. Okay? We need to understand this because of what's happening in the world all around us. That you can do things through God, through Elohim. You know, we need to first get a firm understanding of what, what's going on so that when we look at history of what was and what is, we can change things. Because if, if we're going to make a covenant with God, and this is what Beck was saying, we need, we need to go back. Because we're going down, he said. Yeah, we are, unless God helps. But why would God want to help you if you're a hypocrite? Why would God want to help you if you're not really turning back to God? Yeah, you know, uh, the guy on Real America's Voice, I forgot his name. You know, he's saying, you know, they're preaching against homosexuality. You're worshiping on Sunday. That's idolatry. Because our God said, remember the Sabbath day, the Shabbat, keep it holy. And he doesn't change. Okay? So we need to stop listening to the devil and we need to listen to Elohim. Okay? Because when you stop listening to Elohim, then you're listening to the devil. And the devil says you can't do it. As I said a moment ago, you know, when, 
when Jehovah was giving me this lesson, he said, do you really think I would give you something that was too hard for you to do? I made you. I programmed you. Would he give us something that was too hard? Something that his children couldn't achieve? But he wants you choosing him. You know, it's like when, when a man proposes to a woman. He's choosing her over all the other flowers in the field. And it says in Scripture, when a man finds a wife... He finds a good thing. And she, need, and she gets asked a question. She has to accept and then keep her vows and he has to keep his vows. But we don't know how to keep vows. We don't know how to keep covenants any longer. Because if you can't serve God, how can you serve one another? Okay, let's write that down. If you can't serve God, how can you serve one another? For the mitzvah which I'm giving you today is not too hard for you. It is not beyond your reach. Amen? What he's saying in verse 11 is keeping our part of the covenant is not out of our reach. Jehovah's going to keep his part. He's always going to keep his part. But he says in verse 11, it's not out of your reach. You can do it. It's an it's a attitude problem. It's what you want. Then you'll what if you want something bad enough, you will you will do it. You know, people will do everything in their power to get what they want. So keeping our part of the covenant is not out of our reach. When the pilgrims wanted to come to America. The Europeans said it was out of their reach. The boat's too small. Too many people. You're leaving at the wrong time. All these things were stacked up against them. But they needed to go at that point or they thought they'd never get here. So people will tell you that you can't achieve your goal. And with God, your goal can be achieved. And the main goal is getting into heaven. That's the, that's the goal. But if you don't believe in heaven, one day you will find out that there really is a heaven. Okay? So people will try to stop you. The devil will try to stop you. But that following God's commandments, all of them that are for you, heaven's laws, it's not too hard for you. It's not out of your reach. No matter what a pastor or a rabbi or some leader of a religious establishment says that you can't do it, you can do it, and Deuteronomy 30, verse 11 says so. Let's go on to verse 14 and 15 now. Because all things are possible with, with Elohim. Verse 14 and 15. On the contrary, the word is very close to you. In your mouth, even in your heart. Therefore, you can do it. Look, I am presenting you today with, on one hand, life and good, and on the other, <coughs> death and evil. Amen? So, the first thing that we have to, to look at is, are there any errors in the Bible? No, there are no errors in the Bible. Are there any lies in the Bible? Only the ones from Satan. When he says, did God really say you would die? So in verse 14 and 15, Moshe is telling them, and he's telling us, remember the word of the eternal Father. Write that for your notes. Remember the word of the eternal Father. Remember the word of the Eternal Father. Remember the word of the Eternal Father. And it said in verse 14, the word is in your heart. You know, it, it says the word is in your heart. 
People don't believe that the Word of God is in your heart. Was the Word of heart in Noah, in Noah's heart? Was the Word of God in Noah's heart? Now let me ask you a question. Was heaven's laws in Noah's heart? How did, how did Noah tell the difference between clean animals and unclean animals? How did he tell the difference between clean and unclean since the Torah was not written? Abraham, Abraham had not been born. Moses had not been born yet. It wouldn't come for a long time. So how did Noah tell the difference between he needed to get seven pairs of clean animals, right? How did Noah know what was clean and unclean since the Torah had not been written? Because our reference is Genesis 7, verse 2. Of every clean animal, you are to take seven couples. Of the animals that are not clean, one couple. Did Noah look on the tag on their... On their Collar and say, clean or unclean? How did Noah know what was a clean animal and an unclean animal? Because the word of God is inside of us. So the only biblical conclusion to come up with is that the word is inside of us. Okay? Torah was not written at this point. Abraham, Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were not born yet. We had not spent our 400, over 400 years in, in slavery yet. We had not gone to Har Sinai, Mount Sinai, to receive the, the mitzvot. Keeping the covenants is, pure, is purely and simply a heart issue. Anybody who teaches otherwise is a devil. It's a demon. It's a heart issue. You just don't want to do it. Let's go back to 1 Samuel now. I told you to hold your spot. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22 and 23. 1 Shmuel chapter 15, verse 22 and 23. Charlie Kirk, that's his name. Shmuel said, does Jehovah take as much pleasure in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying what Jehovah says? Surely obeying is better than sacrifice and heeding orders than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of sorcery. Stubbornness like the crime of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of Jehovah, he too has rejected you as king. Amen? Now in verse 23, we looked at rebellion, right? Rebellion is like stubbornness. And in all these years of ministry, that's what I find is the biggest problem with everybody, is people are just stubborn. I don't want to do that. I don't think I have to do that. What it comes down to is you're stubborn. You're, you're definitely stubborn. Because you either want to listen to God or you don't. Where are you going to go when you die? If you're listening to yourself, you're not going to be in the Father's house because it is a monarchy. We're not going to have a committee in heaven. For God so loved the world, he didn't send a committee. He sent his son. Okay? So when we look at rebellion, it's, it's like stubbornness, and that's really the biggest problem with most people. Do, do you agree? Most people you see are, are pretty stubborn. You, you try to talk to them, you, you lay out a foundation of, you know, you're trying to give them the word of God, or you're even trying to convince them of something else. That you've been through yourself, or, uh, or you've had experience with, and you're trying to save them heartache, and no, we've got to do it this way. I've already done it twice. And I found it that if you do it that way, you're going to, it's going to be a problem. Most people, that is their biggest problem. 
is you can talk to them about the Word of God. You can lay out from Genesis through to Revelation. And no, you're, you're wrong. They're stubborn. I mean, the Lord can use your stubbornness, and we'll get to that in a little while. If you're stubborn for the right reasons, Jehovah Elohim could use that. Okay? You know, if, if people were stubborn against trying to take the law away, that would be great. Okay? If people were stubborn, you know, when you wanted to, they want to take God's word away, you know, that would be great. No, you can't take that away from me. This is my life. Okay? Did you ever really stop to think, Kurt? Did you ever really stop to think about the Ten Commandments? Really, really think about that. You know, when, you, when you're turning back to God, did you really think about the Ten Commandments? Okay? Number seven, don't commit adultery. Did Jehovah say those words to Jew and Gentile? Don't commit adultery. He said it to everybody. Don't commit adultery. Why did Jehovah say those words to Jew and Gentile? Because feeding the flesh is simple. You know, that's why Yeshua said, even if you look at a woman in lust, you've already committed adultery in your heart. Because you're going to desire it and you're going to go after it. So we should be zealous for, yes, I want to hold on to this. I don't want number seven to be removed. I don't want, we can't remove adultery from off the, you know. So if you're not under the law anymore, then go ahead, commit adultery. Feeding the flesh is really very simple. You know, in John chapter 8, in John chapter 8, we got the woman that was, that was caught in adultery. It doesn't say she was being forced to commit adultery. She was actively part of what was going on. If she would have considered what that was going to do to her life, in the law, and it's the death penalty, when she was committing adultery in John chapter 8, she was destroying her family and his family. You ever think of that? Oh, Yeshua forgave her. Yes, because they didn't bring the man. The law says bring the man. Stone them both to death. Yeshua would not have forgiven her if they brought the man, but they didn't bring the man. But let's think about this for a second. Let's, let's, let's step back from that for a moment. Because she was an active participant in the act of committing adultery. She wasn't just destroying her own marriage. She was destroying his marriage. Did you ever stop to think about that? That those kids were now going to be without a parent? And in the biblical sense of the law, those, those people would have been dead. So the, the child was, was without his mother or father because of what they were doing. Did you ever consider that? Did you ever think of that? So we should be zealous for, we want to keep number seven. We want to keep, I want to keep number seven. Did you ever stop to think about number six? Do not murder. We should be zealous for that law. Don't, don't, no, don't, don't remove that. It's not good to murder. Okay? Because what happens when you murder? You destroy that person's life. And what else is it destroying? Was that person a mother or father? A son or daughter? An employer? You know, what if that guy owned a business and you killed him? There's nobody to take care of the business. What's going to happen to the business? What's going to happen to all the people that worked for that person? Was that person that got murdered married? What are those kids going to do for a father or a mother? Where are they going to live? Are they going to have to be given to the government to take care of? We should be zealous for keeping that law. Okay? 
What if, you, what if the, the guy murders a woman and she was pregnant? And both she and the baby die. But that baby was going to be the one who cured cancer. Shouldn't we be zealous for keeping the law? Shouldn't we be zealous for keeping thou shall not murder? Number six. How many people think we should be zealous for that? We should be zealous for that. We should be zealous for number seven, not committing adultery. So we should be very strong for not wanting any of heaven's laws to be removed. You know, we should be, you, you shouldn't steal. Eight, number eight. We should be zealous for number nine. We, we should not lie. We should be zealous for those words that the Father gave to us. We should be strong for not wanting any of heaven's laws removed. You know, Charlie Kirk and his three pastors that were on on Thanksgiving Day there, they were zealous for going against the, the homosexuals and being strong in the church. And other churches, they were saying, don't want to touch this subject. We should be zealous for, we should not murder. We should not commit adultery. We should be zealous for not putting any other God besides the Lord's face. We should be zealous for not using his name as vanity. And we should be adamant about those laws not being changed, right? Should we be zealous for not, not wanting to murder, right? We should be zealous for not wanting to lie, right? We should be zealous for not wanting to commit adultery, right? Then why aren't we adamant about the fourth commandment? Why aren't we adamant about that? You know, these Christians are adamant about against homosexuality, against murder. You know, they want to protect the, the babies, and that's good, about abortion. But they're not adamant about keeping the fourth commandment which says, remember the Sabbath day, the Shabbat day, set it apart as holy. Imagine if Yeshua were here, and you said to him, you're adamant about not murdering. Why are you as a Christian allowing the Sabbath to be changed? You know, they're adamant about, about those, those things. They're adamant about protecting the baby. They're adamant against homosexuality. But they're not adamant about having the Sabbath changed. Let's look at 1 Samuel 15, verse 22 and 23. Shmuel said, Does Jehovah take as much pleasure in burnt offerings and sacrificing as sacrifice, and sacrifices as in obeying what Jehovah says? Surely obeying is better than sacrifice, and heeding orders than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of sorcery, stubbornness like the crime of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of Jehovah, he too has rejected you as king. Amen? So in verse 23, he now says, stubbornness is like idolatry. In some of your translations, it uses the word insubordination. I think that's a, a better word than stubbornness. It's a bigger word. But insubordination means disobeying direct orders from a superior. Insubordination means disobeying orders from a direct superior. One more time. Ready for your notes? Insubordination is like not following orders from a superior. And in verse 23, Shmuel says it's like idolatry. So when you're not paying attention to what the master said, master being the father, the son, and the spirit, you're being insubordinate. 
Because Jehovah the Father spoke, remember the Shabbat day, keep it holy. But you're, you're adamant about not having homosexualities, homosexuals in your church. You're, you're preaching the truth. We're going to preach the truth. But you're a hypocrite. You're insubordinate. Because you've made yourself an idol. Because Yeshua said in Matthew 5.18, not one jot or tittle will be missing from the law until heaven and earth pass away. So when you're insubordinate, you're not paying attention to your master. You're not paying attention to your boss. What happens if you don't pay attention to your boss? You're going to get fired. You're not going to have that job too long. If you're not paying attention to your master in heaven, you're not getting in. What happens if, if, when you were a child or if you're a child now? What happens if you don't pay attention to what your parents say? say? If you didn't pay attention to what your parents said, here comes the, the, the spanking, the belt, the, the hairbrush, the shoe. All right, so when you're being insubordinate, that's idolatry because you're making yourself higher than God. Okay? When you're being insubordinate, you're making yourself higher than God. One more time. When you're being insubordinate, you're making yourself higher than God. And that's not going to turn out too well. Let's take a look at the word idolatry in the Hebrew. Let's see what that definition is. Idolatry is H8655. Teraphim. Definition number one, idolatry, idols, images. Teraphim, family idol. Number two, a kind of idol used in household shrine or worship. Let's look at number two a little bit closer. A kind of idol used in household shrine or worship. What does the second commandment say? Don't put anything next to Jehovah's face. Nothing. No idols. Nothing that's going to interfere with what he is telling you. So this shrine that you're putting up to yourself, when you're insubordinate, you're making yourself a shrine. Because you don't want to listen to what God says. Well, the pastor says to do this. What does the Bible say? pastor says we can't follow the law. What did it say in Deuteronomy 30? Verse, uh, Deuteronomy 30? You can do the law. So who are you going to believe? The pastor? Or are you going to believe the word of God? I'm sticking with the word of God. So now when you're insubordinate, you're, you're making yourself an idol. And when you're making yourself an idol, you're breaking your covenant with God. So turning back to God means keeping your covenants with God. And he doesn't make covenants with people that are not going to be obedient to his word. He makes covenants with people who are going to keep his word. Well, when you put something next to Jehovah's face, you're allowing your covenant to be broken. Now, some people make covenants for a certain period of time. You, you might do that. You know, I'll work for, you know, what did Israel say? I'll work for you for seven years for Rachel, right? He made a covenant for seven years. I mean, I, I always listen to that story. I'm like, why didn't you start at a year? <laughs> jump, jump to seven years. Okay, he's doing the Shemitah. I mean, I'm like, Dude, start small and work your way up, you know. Know that you'll give the seven, but you know, start out small. Okay. I guess he's trying to make her feel good. Tell her she's worth twenty horses or something. Exactly. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> so when the person makes a covenant, they can make it for a certain amount of time. So when you make a covenant, you need to be specific. That's another thing. Let's write that for our notes. When you make a covenant, you need to be very specific. The terms need to be specific. When we make a covenant with Elohim, that means our covenants need to be eternal. When you make a covenant with God, you're, you need to be specific. You need to be very specific with what you're doing. Give me a second here. Time for the second part of this dose. All right, back to the lesson. When we make a covenant with Elohim, he's specific so you should understand the terms. You should understand what he wants from you. And he's very, very clear on what he expects of you. And he does, says it's not going to be hard for you. But as I said earlier, it's all about a heart issue. Because you can be very sure that when... Elohim makes a covenant with us. He is going to keep his covenant. And when you make a covenant, when you accept Yeshua, the Messiah as your Messiah, there are things he wants you to change. What did he say to the woman that was caught in adultery? Go sin no more. So when you accept Yeshua, when you accept Messiah, that means you've got to sin no more. Well, where do you get the definition of sin? Well, that would be found in the first five books of your Bible called the Torah. When you make a covenant, you must understand what you are doing. That's what most people don't, because, you know, how, what's the rate of a divorce in America? It's over 50%. It's over 50% with the Christians. I thought you were supposed to be covenant-keeping people. When you make a covenant, that's why we write a ketubah. You see this piece of paper that's at a Hebrew wedding called a ketubah. In the ketubah, it is written what the husband's going to give the wife. It's a contract. It's a written contract, what he's providing for his bride. So when God gave us his ketubah, he wrote it down for us, right? Wrote it down in... Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And this covenant goes from generation to generation. This covenant that he made with Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov keeps going until the end of eternity. It goes from generation to generation. It does not stop. It does not get broken. But many people don't think that covenants go from gener generation to generation. Many of the people who call themselves followers of Jesus think that the Jews have been replaced by the church. And that would make the father a liar. Does anybody believe that the father is a liar? Nobody believes that the father is a liar. He's not going to replace Israel with another people. There's always been Jewish believers in the Messiah. You know, the church says, the Jews missed their Messiah. What religion were the disciples? Buddhists? 
Catholics. Peter was the first Catholic, right? See, people believe in replacement theology. Replacement theology is this, for those that don't know. They say the church has replaced Israel as God's chosen people. Then that would mean that the Father broke his covenant. And the Father does not break covenants. There has always been at least one Jewish person that's been following God. And all the Jews didn't deny Messiah. We got the disciples. All of them are Jewish. Even the one that portrayed Messiah, Yehuda and Judas, he was Jewish too. And that's what many of the people forget. There's always been Jewish believers in the Messiah from the time Messiah came here as a human. Come to think of it, what religion was Yeshua? Hindu? Oh, he was a Jew too. So covenants are made from generation to generation. Let's write that for our notes. Covenants are kept from generation to generation. Covenants are kept from generation to generation. Covenants are kept from generation to generation. So when the land was dedicated to Elohim, before they got off the Mayflower, before they got off the Mayflower, they dedicated the land that they were going to go to, to Elohim. Before one foot, before they stepped one foot on this land, they gave it to God. So, just because some people during that time period, from the 1600s to now, have broken the covenant, does not mean that the covenant has been broken by God himself. So, by turning back to God, and what that means biblically is going back to the laws of God, heaven's laws, then God will keep his covenant with this land because of what those people did. We'll get into what they did in a few minutes. Before the pilgrims stepped foot on this land, what we were celebrating on Thursday, Thanksgiving, a national Thanksgiving to thank the Lord, they dedicated this country, this land. It wasn't a country then, it was just land. They dedicated it to the Father in heaven. When those people said order for this country, when they made the first government, when the pilgrims made the first government, they're in Massachusetts. They all agreed on the laws of God. And they kept heaven's laws. They didn't keep the laws of God. I'm going to prove to you that they did. And what they wrote. What we'll get to in a little while. Because from generation to generation, Yeshua says, stay on the narrow path. Right? Didn't Messiah say that? You got to stay on the narrow path. He said, don't deviate to the right or left. He said, stay on the narrow path, go in through the narrow gate. He said the road is wide, right? Why is it wide? Because people don't want to make covenants. They don't want to keep covenants. There's lots of religions out there. Over 1,500 different denominations of Christianity. And even the Messianic Judaism, there's a lot of different forms of that now. A lot of different flavors in the uh, ice cream parlor now. But we have to go through the... You want to get into heaven? It's a narrow road. It's a narrow gate. It's a narrow path. You have to keep your covenants. Because the Father is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Right? Malachi 3.6. Yeshua is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13.8. Matthew 5.18. Not one jot or tittle will be lost from the law until heaven and earth disappear. So we must understand that covenants are kept from generation to generation. Let's go to 1 Samuel 15, verse 24 and 25. 
Shaul said to Shmuel, I have sinned. I violated the order of Jehovah and your words too, because I was afraid of the people and listened to what they said. We're going to actually go to verse 28. Now, please pardon my sin and come back with me so I can worship Jehovah. But Shmuel said to Shaul, I will not go back with you because you have rejected the word of Jehovah. And Jehovah has rejected you as king over Israel. And Shmuel was turning, as Shmuel was turning around to leave, he took hold of the hem of his cloak and it tore. Shmuel said to him, Jehovah has torn the kingdom of Israel away from you today and given it to a fellow countryman of yours who is better than you. Amen? When we reject the word of God, we're rejecting Jehovah himself. Let's write that for our notes. When you reject the word of God, you reject Jehovah himself. When you reject the word of God, you reject Jehovah himself. When you reject the word of God, you reject Jehovah himself. So in the beginning of that passage, in verse 24, Shaul says he was afraid of the people. Many people reject the word of God because they're afraid what's going to happen next. Yeshua said to the people, I come here to bring a sword. I come here to set fire. I come here to divide families. I wish it was going to be all happy and great, everybody. But it's going to be a hard road. Because we're sinners. And we want to, we, we're stubborn. That's why Jehovah calls the Jewish people stiff neck, right? That's not a compliment unless you're being stiff necked for keeping God's laws. You know, we should be zealous for keeping the commandments. We should be zealous for keeping the words of God. Because when we reject his word, we reject him himself. And when you die, you're not going to be getting into his monarchy house. Because it said that in 1 Samuel 15, verses 24 to 28. We re- he, Shaul rejected the word of God. Now, what's interesting about this passage is God didn't kill him. He just rejected him. See, God still allows you to wallow in your stupidity. He also gives you an opportunity to change. Didn't he give any, all of us an opportunity to change? Has anybody stayed the same since meeting Messiah? I know I haven't. But when you reject the word of God, you reject Messiah. You reject Jehovah the Father. And what happened when Shaul rejected the word of God? He removed his blessing. He was the king, right? So when you reject God's word, he removes your blessing. And that can be found in the blessings and the curses in Deuteronomy 28, correct? In Viacra 26 and Leviticus 26. When you reject his word, when you, when you turn your back to God means not rejecting his word. But when you reject his word, he removes your blessing. The guy was the king of all Israel. But he rejected the word of God. So God didn't kill him, he just removed him from being king. And when you remove God's word, you go from being the head to being the tail. How many people would like to be the head instead of the tail? I'd rather be the head instead of the tail. Let's look at verse 27 and 28 now. As Shmuel was turning around to leave, he took hold of the hem of his cloak and it tore. Shmuel said to him, Jehovah has torn the kingdom of Israel away from you today and given it to a fellow countryman of yours who is better than you. Amen. He he takes away from those who don't want to follow and gives it to somebody that will follow. 
Now, what's on the hem of the cloak? What tore away from Shmuel? What did, what did Shaul grab? What's on the hem of the garment? The seat seat, right? So when you tear away the seat seat, you tear away your blessing. Let's write that for our notes. When you tear away the seat seat, you tear away your blessings. When you tear away the seat seat, you tear away your blessings. When you tear away the seat seat, you tear away your blessings. When you tear away the tzitzit, you tear away your blessings. Because he didn't want to follow them, so why, why have them on? Just take them off. So it was torn away from him. He was a king, and now you, your place is going to be given to somebody else. You had it all. And all of us can have the same part of that kingdom. But it's our choice. God didn't force Shaul to follow, right? He chose, chose to follow, and he chose not to follow. The choice is all of ours, everybody. That's how, that's how secure our God is. <coughs> so the seats he were torn away from him because he didn't want to follow God's laws, so he tore them away. So when you're disobedient, Jehovah gives your kingdom to somebody else. That's going to happen here. America is one of the... There's so much here, so many, so many great blessings in this nation. So much resources, so much gold, silver, metals, precious metals, food, places to live. That's going to be all torn away because we don't want to follow God any longer. So when you're disobedient, God gives your place to somebody else. So Shaul didn't want to be obedient, so God said, okay, I'm going to give you your place to somebody else. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 9, please. Anybody learn anything here so far? Deuteronomy, Devarim, chapter 9. We're going to look at verse 1 through 5. Listen, Israel. You are to cross the Yarden today to go in and dispossess nations greater and stronger than you. Great cities, fortified up to the sky. A people great and tall, the Anakim, whom you knew about and whom you have heard it said, who can stand before the descendants of Anak? Anak sorry. Therefore understand today that Jehovah, your Elohim, will himself cross ahead of you as a devouring fire, he will destroy them and bring them down before you. Thus will you drive them out and cause them to perish quickly, as Jehovah has said to you. Don't think to yourself after your Elohim has pushed them out ahead of you, it is to reward my greatness that Jehovah has brought me in to take possession of this land. That was because of these, these nations have been so wicked that Jehovah is driving them out ahead of you. Verse 5, it is not because of your righteousness or because your heart is so upright that, that, to, that you go in to take possession of their land, but to punish their, their, the wickedness of these nations that Jehovah your Elohim is driving them out ahead of you, and also to confirm the word which Jehovah swore to your ancestors, Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, amen. Go back to verse number 4. And listen to this very carefully. Don't think to yourself, after your Elohim has punished, has pushed them out ahead of you, it is to reward my righteousness that Jehovah brought 
has brought me in to take possession of this land. No, it is because these nations have been so wicked that Jehovah is driving them out ahead of you. Amen. Now, in verse number four, were these nations that were being driven out Jews or Gentiles? They were Gentiles? Yes, look at verse number four again. Don't think to yourself after your Elohim has pushed them out ahead of you, it is to reward my righteousness that Jehovah has brought me in to take possession of this land. No, it is because these nations have been so wicked that Jehovah is driving them out ahead of you. Amen? What standard is he using? How could he judge a nation if they didn't have the law? Hmm. Back to Noah, huh? How did Noah know how to get seven pairs of clean animal? Animals. So in verse 4, he's driving out Gentile nations ahead of those that believe and follow God. He's driving, he's saying they're wicked. How could he say they're wicked unless they knew the law and didn't want to follow it? So let's put this into perspective, everybody. These nations, these Gentile nations, for 400 years have been living on the promised land, rent-free. Think of that. He, then now they're going in after 40 years in the desert. They've been over 400 years as slaves. So these people, these Gentiles, these Gentiles were living in the promised land. Now the Father has said, as we just read in verse 4, it's because they have been so wicked that I'm remo- I am going to remove them. Now Israel, by Jehovah's hand, is going to be brought out of bondage, right? Then they walk through the desert for 40 years. That whole generation dies. All those men die. Now they're going into the, they're about ready to go into the promised land. Jehovah says in verse number 4, I'm going to go ahead of you and remove these Gentiles because they've been wicked. So somebody who says that the Gentiles don't have to follow the law might just want to read verse number 4. Right, Charlie Kirk? Right, Glenn Beck? Right, Jim Staley? God judged these Gentiles and he said they were wicked. 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 So he's going to judge them because they're being so wicked. I'm, and he said, he said, and he takes it personal. I'm going to drive them out ahead of you. Look at verse four again. It's very important for today's lesson. Don't think to yourself after your Elohim has pushed them out ahead of you. It is to reward my righteousness that Jehovah has brought me in to take possession of this land. No, it is because these nations have been so wicked that Jehovah is driving them out ahead of you. Amen. So he's driving them out. He's driving these Gentiles, and he's, he's let them live there for 400 years. So now it's all a personal thing, because salvation is personal. Go to verse 4, four again. Don't think to yourself after your Elohim has pushed them out ahead of you. It is toward my righteousness that you have brought me in to take possession of this land, no, it is because these nations have been so wicked that Jehovah is driving them out ahead of you. Amen? Do you think he's done this any other place? Or he just did this in Israel? Hmm, we're going to get into a history lesson a little bit. He did that right here in America. We're going to get into some really information. Really interesting information. So after 400 years, he let them live there for 400 years. Over 400 years. Then there's another 40 years in the desert. So over 440 years, these Gentiles 
were living on the prom- in the promised land, doing whatever they want. They, weren't, they knew the laws of God, because God would never chastise somebody unless they knew the laws, right? So he said in verse number four, because these nations have been so wicked that I'm going to drive them out ahead of you. He's got to have one standard, right? Noah knew the, the law because it was in his heart. Jehovah's driving them away. He's driving them away. He's driving the Gentiles away from the places that they were living because he doesn't find what their behavior to be good. Hmm. Should we do anything to stop him? Isn't this racist? Isn't this wrong? They don't know the law. Hmm. So he's going he's gonna to move these Gentiles off that land and give it to somebody else who will follow him. Now hold your place there and turn to Deuteron- Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 12 now. Hold your place in Deuteronomy 9. Go to Deuteronomy 12, verse 29 through 31. Let's get a little bit bigger picture of what's going on here. Deuteronomy, Deverine 12, verse 29 through 31. When Jehovah your Elohim has cut off ahead of you the nations you are entering in order to dispossess, when you have dispossessed them and are living in their land, be careful after they have been destroyed ahead of you not to be trapped into following them, that you inquire after their gods and ask, how did these nations serve their gods? I want to do the same. You must not do this to Jehovah your Elohim, for they have done it to their gods, all the abominations that Jehovah hates. They even burn their, up their sons and daughters in the fire for their gods. Amen? Look at verse 31 again. You must not do this to your Jehovah. You must not do this to Jehovah your Elohim. For they have done to their gods all the abominations that Jehovah hates. They even burn up their sons and daughters in the fire for their gods. Amen. So these Gentiles are doing things that Jehovah hates. How do they know what Jehovah likes and dislikes? Oh, remember Noah. So when Jehovah gives you the land, you're supposed to act properly when he gives you a blessing. Not to act like a bunch of donkeys. You're supposed to honor the gift that he gives you. So when he gives you a wife or he gives you a great job, gives you a home, gives you food to eat, you, you should honor his gifts with thanksgiving. That's what Thursday was all about. A national day of thanksgiving. You should honor and reverence the, the gift that he gave to you. You should take care of the gift that he gives to you. And we should dedicate the land that he gives to us, as we did here, for a very high purpose. And we should do it from generation to generation. Look at verse 31. You must not do this to Jehovah your Elohim, for they have done it to their gods, all the abomination, abominations that Jehovah hates. They even burn up their sons and daughters in the fire of their gods. Amen? So now we're going to take a look at that history lesson that I was telling you about. About a covenant that was made couple of hundred years ago on this land that we're living here. And people got moved off this land because they didn't want to follow the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we're also going to look at why these blessings are disappearing. Why is uh, beef going to cost wholesale $10 a pound when it used to be $2 a pound? Why is everything going up? Why are our blessings disappearing? 
what's the reason that they're disappearing? For if Jehovah keeps his covenant, are we breaking our covenant? So we, we read in De- Deuteronomy 12 that he tore those, the land away from those people and gave it to us, right? Deuteronomy 9 and Deuteronomy 12, we're hearing the same, we're seeing different parts of the same story. That he tore the land away from these people that did not want to follow him, these Gentiles, and gave it to his people. And he said, don't act like them. Don't treat me like they treated their pagan gods. Now, if he doesn't tear it away from us the way we're acting right now, then Jehovah has become a hypocrite. I don't think Jehovah, the Father of all eternity, is ever a hypocrite. Now, I looked up. I was like, let me look up and see. How many nations have Thanksgiving? There are some nations that have, there are seven nations in total that have thanksgivings, but they're not for the same reason that we're doing it here. Only Canada is similar to us, but it didn't start out like that. It has morphed into thanking God. Now Canada is now a pagan nation. So there's only one nation on the planet that does thanksgiving like we do thanking, nationally thanking God for all his provisions, and that's America. But that covenant started before those people got off the boat called the Mayflower. Now, how did that start? Why did these people want to come here in the first place? Well, in the year 1534, England had officially established the Church of England, which now welcomes homosexuality into its gates. But in the year 1534, a revival started after the church got started. Heretic teachings started to take hold in the Church of England, where the Puritans were. So there was a group of people that wanted to separate that from the Church of England, and they were led by a group called the Puritans. And the Puritans had to meet separately, in secret, because they wanted to go back to following the Bible, the way it said to follow the Bible. They were sometimes referred to as separatists, because they didn't, they didn't want to do the things the churches were doing. And then a the group of separatists is also called the pilgrims. So they had to meet in people's homes. Hmm. Because the established religion didn't want them doing what they were doing? Hmm. Where did the disciples meet? Hmm. In people's homes. So this group of separatists or pilgrims all started from the Church of England. So they started somewhere in the regular mainstream church. But because they wanted to follow in spirit and in truth, they had to separate from that church body. And what they did, the pilgrims formed a covenant congregation. Write that for your notes. It's good to look up. Pilgrims formed a covenant congregation. The pilgrims formed a covenant congregation. That means they had a covenant with the people in, in their group to work together to serve God. But by the year 1607, the pilgrims had to leave England because they were being persecuted. They, they got found out. And they were being persecuted by somebody called King James, who himself was a homosexual. So the pilgrims crossed the English Channel and went to a country called Holland. And they lived in a city called Amsterdam for a while. And they strengthened their very tight-knit covenant community. So why did they flee? 
because they wanted to follow the Bible from beginning to end. They wanted to follow the things literally. They wanted to do the things commanded in the Bible. But because the earthly King James didn't want them to, he was persecuting them. So anytime you go against main, the mainline religion, they ostracize you. They persecute you. Just like they persecuted Yeshua. He didn't come here to start a new religion. He came here to call you back to the covenant that the Father had made with everybody. But while in Holland, they suffered a great hardship because they were a small group in a foreign land. But they trusted in God. And they were there for over 10 years. And they moved from Amsterdam to Leiden, Holland. This was of God. When they were in Leiden, or Leiden, Holland, they met some Jews from Spain. Because during that same time period, from the 1400s to the 1600s, what was going on in Europe against the Jews? The Inquisition. So these Jews were living in Holland from Spain. And these pilgrims, these separatists, met the people of the book, the Jewish people. This would become something that was very important, especially when they came here to make a covenant. That was the year 1609. Pilgrims moved from Amsterdam to Leiden, Holland, and they would meet some Jew, a group of Jews, many Jews, because the Jews had left Spain because of the Inquisition and because of the Muslims. Muslims had taken over much of Europe, and so the Jews had to run for their lives. Because Spain had been occupied by Islamic conquerors for seven, years, seven centuries, and the Muslims would force them to convert to Islam, or they would just kill you. Sort of like they're still doing today. But then Queen Ferd King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella rose up. And in 1492, you know, Columbus sailed the blue. And everybody on Columbus's boat that left on the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria, those were all Jews leaving Spain that same night because that was the same, same day Christopher Columbus left. It's the same day the Inquisition began in Spain. So Cristoforo Colombo was from Cologne, Italy. That's where all the Jews lived. They called them the Moranos, the pigs. So now the Jews were in Spain, and then they got kicked out of Spain. And they moved to Holland, where they met the separatists, the Puritans that wanted to go back to following the Bible the way it commanded them. So you either left with Christopher Columbus on the Nina de Pinta de Santa Maria, you left to go find a place to live in Holland, in the Netherlands. Some Jews fled to the Netherlands. Okay, Those countries would accept any religion. So the Jews were able to practice the religion. And they were tolerated in the Netherlands and in Holland and in Amsterdam, the largest city in Holland. And you know what else happened when the Jews moved there in the 1600s? It became the wealthiest city in Holland. Hmm. God bless the Jewish people for following the laws. So in 1575, the Jews also were being accepted in those countries. And they got positions as professors at the University of Leiden. And the, this university was known for its biblical studies, especially in languages of Hebrew, Aramaic, and Syriac. And this is where the pilgrims met a Jewish rabbi, a professor, at that school, who taught them all about 
first half of the book, which they were seeking. The Church of England was not teaching because they didn't know about the laws of God. So they had to move from England to Holland and suffer great hardships so that they can learn <clears throat> the Bible from a Jewish rabbi at the University of Leiden in Holland. Don't you think that's kind of interesting? Move all those places, and they, this group of covenant people learned Hebrew, Aramaic, and Syriac from a Jew at the University of Leiden, where William Brewster began teacher, teaching at that same college. And he, it turned out that the head of the pilgrims, this William Brewster, was very good with languages himself. He would be also be taught about the Moedim, the feasts that he was so much wanted to know about that the Church of England was not teaching. So here was the head of the pilgrims, he was a professor at this college. He was now being taught about all of God's feasts, not the Jewish feasts, their heaven's feasts. The Father's feast that he gave to us because he said in Leviticus 23, these are my feasts. Including the Feast of Tabernacles, or Sukkot that we call it. That's why Thanksgiving started in October, the Harvest Festival. Because he learned it from this Jewish rabbi, this professor at the university. He learned all about the feasts. And he knew that Sukkot, or what he knows as a, the Harvest Festival, the Feast of Tabernacles, would be celebrated sometime in the end of the, the, the October. And that's why at the end of the year, that first Thanksgiving, it's a Sukkot, everybody. As we still have problems today with the calendar, we have people that don't cite the moon. We have people that cite the moon. We have people that follow a whole other calendar. But what he wanted to do was celebrate God's holy days. So the pilgrims identified as Jews. That's why when they came here, they wanted to... What was the, the national language supposed to be? Hebrew. Yes, Hebrew. The pilgrims identified with the Jews whose ancestors covenant together with God. These people, the pilgrims, the separatists, were looking to make a covenant with God. They identified with the Jews because of Pharaoh's persecution. So you say the pilgrims were persecuted in England. They wanted to follow the Bible the way it said. And here they were meeting Jews who were being persecuted from the Inquisition that had moved from Spain to Holland for the people from England, from the Church of England, to go to Holland because they were being persecuted. So they assimilated as Jews. They found a parallel, and even from crossing the water. To get to Holland from Eng England is an island, everybody, right? They had to cross water to get to the Promised Land. Okay? So they, they thought themselves as, wow, we're like Jews. And they wanted to follow the scriptures the way that God had intended. They were persecuted like the Jews were persecuted for wanting to follow God. The Jews were persecuted in Spain for wanting to keep the commandments. So they crossed the sea and they entered the promised land of Holland. So the pilgrims, before they left for the new world, made a covenant with God. They fled from the king of England and crossed the waters to hopefully enter America, which they thought would be the promised land. Now, during their time in Holland, the Jews greatly influenced the pilgrims. So when they came here, they wanted to keep the Bible and have a government established on God's laws. Let's write that for our notes. Pilgrims wanted to establish a government set on God's laws. Pilgrims wanted to establish a government set on God's laws. 
pilgrims want to establish a government set on God's laws. And to confirm that, all you got to read is the first Supreme Court Justice, John Jay's writings, and you know that to be true. So our government is supposed to be set up just like the Bible. That's the way the government, the pilgrims was. The people made a covenant with each other, getting their rights from God. That's why it says in the Constitution, these inalienable rights are given to us by God. Because the pilgrims established that way before 1776. At least a hundred years before that. And in this covenant, each person was personally accountable to God for their actions. So people living in the community would have to believe and follow God's commandments. Not like we have today where we don't follow any God's commandments. We can't even pray in public. The church can't even get it right. They can't even get the day of worship right. They're willing to preach against homosexuality, but they're not willing to preach against ham sandwiches. So the people of the covenant would get rights from God. God gives us our rights. If you follow me, I'll bless you. If you don't follow me, I'll curse you. It's real simple. And he wrote it down and it doesn't change. But on December 15th, 1670, 1617, El- Elder William Brewster and Pastor John Robinson wrote a letter to Leiden Holland. London financier Sir Edwin Sandy explaining how the pilgrims were trying to come to the new world. He made a deal to come here with this man to find he wanted to finance the boat. So they sold themselves to do work for this man for seven years. Hmm, where do they get that from? You finance our trip. We'll work for you for seven years. Those Jews again with all those laws. And Pastor John Robinson is considered one of the founders of the Congregational Church. He founded a church. The word congregation refers to people in communion together or covenant. People in covenant. Hold your place where you are and turn to Matthew 16. Verse number 18. Matthew 16, verse number 18. Anybody learn anything now? It's all about a covenant. Matthew 16, verse number 18 says, I also tell you this, you are kepha, on this rock I will build my community, and the gates of Sheol will not overcome it. Let's focus on the word community. What does that say in the, in the Greek? In some of your translations it says church. It is G1577. The word in Greek is ecclesia. It means, number one, a gathering of citizens called out from their homes into some public place. An assembly. Number two, an assembly of Israelites. Number three, an assembly of Christians gathered to worship in a religious meeting. Number four, a company of Christians or of those who hope for eternal salvation through Yeshua the Messiah. Number five, those who anywhere in the city, village, constitute as such a company are united in one body. Let's go back to definition number one. Gathering of citizens called out from from their homes to some public place in assembly. So the church is a group of citizens agreeing in a public assembly. They're agreeing on the same things. So the pilgrims left England because they didn't like the way King James was running things and they wanted to worship God, the only king of all creation. So when you see the word church, The word is ecclesia, which means a group of people in agreement in a covenant. 
with one another and with God. Hmm. Covenants. When you make a covenant, you must agree on the terms of the covenant, right? <clears throat> when you make a contract, you must agree on the terms of the contract, right? So the pilgrims were all in agreement with the word of God. All the word of God. You can't keep Sabbath and not keep the Shemitah, Jim Staley. If you have land, you let it rest every seven years. Why can't you do that? He said, all, all of Israel, we're not in Israel, this is only for Israel. And so is the Shabbat. You can't have it both ways. You have to be in a covenant. You have to be in a community. All of it, did all of Israel take the land all at once? No. So in the beginning, the Shemitah didn't go together because you didn't have your own land because you hadn't taken it yet. So they came to the New World and they were supposed to go. The pilgrims set sail. They set sail for... They were supposed to come to Virginia, to the Jamestown. Jamestown had been established 14 years earlier. But Jamestown had a lot of problems because they were not focused on the word of God. So the pilgrims set out, and they had not left England too, too much, and a great storm came up. The storm was so ferocious, it broke them, the main mast. It snapped it. So half the people wanted to go back, but the rest of the pilgrims said, no, we're going. We're going to trust in God to get us there. And when, they, when the ship mass broke, it blew them off course. So instead of heading towards Jamestown, they sailed towards Massachusetts. And they encountered a lot of, a lot of trials during that journey, because you know you take an airplane from here to England it takes you seven hours. This journey would take months. So imagine being on this boat the size of this room for months. And many times the boat was about to sink, but the Lord kept them alive. They were supposed to go to Virginia, but they had a different type of government in Virginia because it was not said in the Bible. So they landed on Plymouth Rock. There was no government for them to submit to. So the pilgrims didn't want to be lawless, so they set up a government before they got off the boat. And they made something called the Mayflower Compact. Compact is another word for covenant. Compact is another word for co covenant. And on, the, on November 11th, 1620, the first constitution was written here in America. And you can read it. It's called the Mayflower Compact. And in it, they proclaimed God as the head of this nation. They dedicated this land to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to his son called, named Yeshua. I'm going to read you what it said in some of it. In the name of God, amen, whose names are underwritten, having undertaken for ye glory of God and advancement of ye Christian faith, a voyage to plant ye first colony in the northern parts of Virginia. In ye presence of God and of one another, covenant and combine ourselves together into civil body politic to enact just and equal laws as shall be thought most meet and covenant for ye general good of ye colony in which we promise all due submission and obedience. Hmm. They came here to, to advance the Bible but there were people living here already. So with this what, they, what you just heard in partiality our government today is a top-down government. The pilgrims had a bottom-up form of government. 
which means the people had to have fear of God, they had to follow God. Okay? And William Brewster was one of the signers of this covenant. He was the one that met all the Jews in the university in Holland. Now we come to the Gentiles that were here in, on America. Go back to Deuteronomy chapter 9. Because how could they how could they kill all those nice Indians? Well, let's see what, what God thought of what the Indians were doing. Does God chastise Gentiles? Deuteronomy 9, verse 4 and 5. Don't think to yourself after your Elohim has punished has pushed them out ahead of you. It's to reward my righteousness that Jehovah has brought me in to take possession of this land. Notice because these nations have been so wicked that Jehovah is driving them out ahead of you. It's not because of your righteousness or because your heart is so upright that you go in to take possession of the land, but to punish the wickedness of these nations that Jehovah your Elohim is driving them out ahead of you, and also to confirm the word which Jehovah swore to your ancestors, Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. Amen. Now, people don't, don't, that don't study history are going to be doomed to repeat it. Many people today say the pilgrims were bad people. They stole the Indians' land. The American government stole the Indians' land. They stole the land from the poor Indians. Well, Jehovah was not stealing their land. It's his land anyway. And we just read how Jehovah took the land of the Gentiles, in Deuteronomy 9, verse 4 and 5, and gave it to his covenant people. So in the beginning, was everybody perfect? No. Even all the pilgrims weren't perfect. But most were. So Jehovah allowed America to grow and prosper. We're the fastest empire ever recorded in history. We are the most prosperous nation ever in history, even more prosperous than Solomon. That's why the Bidens keep sending all of our money to other people. But America was founded on people that did not want to serve a pagan king any longer. They wanted to follow the Bible, and they had to break free. And they had to break free from England. Now, when America was founded, there were literally over 100 nations. There were hundreds of nations here on this land. Over 100 nations. And a new study has found that on this land, prior to America, there were 54 million people. Answers of Genesis has this on their website. There are over 54 million people living on this land that we call America now. Yes, I said that number correct. 54 million people. Look at verse 4 and 5 again. Don't think to yourself after your Elohim has pushed them out ahead of you, it's to reward me, it is to reward my righteousness that Jehovah has brought me and to take possession of this land. That was because these nations have been so wicked that Jehovah is driving them out ahead of you. It's not because your righteousness is because of your heart is so upright that you go and take possession of the land, but to punish the wickedness of these nations, the Yehovah Elohim is, is driving them out ahead of you, and also to confirm the word which Jehovah swore to your ancestors, Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. Amen? So there's many warring nations on this land, they're killing one another. They're at war with one another. They're kidnapping their children. They're killing their children. They're sacrificing them to other gods. God, the God of all creation, says, no more of this. So he brings these Bible-believing people to this land. And the pilgrims had peace with the Indians for 50 years. And they brought them the Messiah, Yeshua. But then, this spread. And the truth needed to spread to this whole land. 
There were 54 million people here. Many different nations that didn't want to accept the truth. Just like we just read about in Deuteronomy 9, verse 4 and 5. But an interesting thing happened when these people in Answers in Genesis did this study of these people. They all had accounts of a great flood in their history. Isn't that interesting? And also in all their history, they had some, something about creation that took seven days. Yes. In all the literature that they found, all the anthropology that they found, and all the, the studies that they found, all these people that America supposedly stole their land, they all had the creation story in their culture. They all had the great flood in their culture, whether it be pictures on the wall or generation to generation stories and something called the Red Book. They found the Red Book. All these nations had seven days of creation. All these nations had a story of the great flood. So let's go to verse 4 and 5 again. Deuteronomy 9, verse 4 and 5. Don't think to yourself after your Elohim has pushed them out ahead of you, this reward, my righteousness that Jehovah has brought me in, to take possession of the land. It was because these nations have been so wicked that Jehovah is driving them out ahead of you. It's not because of your righteousness or because your heart is so upright that you go and take possession of their land, but to punish the wickedness of these nations that Jehovah your Elohim is driving them out ahead of you. And also to confirm the word which Jehovah swore to your ancestors, Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. Amen? Do you know what they found in the western part of the Grand Canyon? Hmm. They found an Egyptian pyramid. And in the pictures there, and you can go to the Smithsonian Institute to see this, picture of a very Jewish-looking man, which they called Yosef. Remember when, Yosef, when there was a famine in the world? Yosef had, had got to go get grain from everywhere in the world. He actually came here to America, and he brought the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then after that, Solomon sent ships here, and he could go to the Los Lunas Rock and see the Ten Commandments in Hebrew dating back over 2,000 years ago. So we didn't take their land. They were offered the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. As we just read, God drove them out in front of us. So the pagan nations who refuse the gospel, God removes. Nations that don't want to hear the truth, God removes. So little by little, America took over this land called America. Did Israel take over the promised land all at once? Nope. Did America take all this land at once? Nope. In 1803, President Thomas Jefferson purchased the Louisiana Purchase for a mere $15 million. That was 1803, taking more land and giving it to the believers. Were they all believers? No. Were most of them believers? Yes. In 1853, we had the Gadsden Purchase, which purchased 30,000 square miles of Mexican territory. And that completed the lower 48. So the, the land that you're on was finished in 1853. America took over this land little by little. And in the middle, they had a problem. What was that problem in the middle? Oh, it's called the Civil War. It was over states' rights and keeping people enslaved which the Bible says you can have a slave for seven years. So those nations that didn't want to serve Jehovah, God moved them out. He gave them a serious chastisement. So now we have to make a choice, everybody. God can't allow us to keep going like this because then he's going to be a hypocrite. So answering Charlie Kirk and Jim Staley and Glenn Beck, we have to turn back to God. What does that mean? 
going back to following God's word. That means keeping his Shabbat holy, not stealing, not lying, not coveting, doing his holy days. His holy days, not man-made holy days. Are people going to fight it? Absolutely. Are you going to be separated? Absolutely. But if we don't, God's going to separate us from this land because he's proven it once before. It means we have to go back to heaven's laws. Go around, go last time, Deuteronomy 9, verse 4. Don't think to yourself after your Elohim has pushed them out ahead of you, it is to reward my righteousness that Jehovah has brought me in to take possession of this land. No, it's because these nations have been so wicked that Jehovah is driving them out ahead of you. Amen? So if he's going to drive them out ahead of us, can we become like them and not be chastised ourselves? No. God is slow to anger, but he's angry now. So the pilgrims had to cross the water to get to what they thought was the promised land for them. America was established on the Bible. America's first language was, was supposed to be Hebrew, which most of the pilgrims know, knew because it was taught to them. They learned it from God's chosen people. In a land where both were persecuted, found refuge. This is a land that says, what to say in the Statue of Liberty? Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, wretched refuge from your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest toss to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. This land was set up to be a haven for those seeking God's righteousness, to worship freely, to be pro prosperous, but without God, that's all going to be torn away. And let me tell you, the enemy's already here. God said in Deuteronomy 9, verse 4, you will be driven out if you don't follow his ways. So let's not be driven out any longer. Amen? Amen. Let's just bow our hearts for one moment, please. Thank you, Lord, for this greatly encouraging lesson. If you're out there today, your first step in this long journey, this long, beautiful journey, if you don't know Messiah, you have to let him into your life. So you're saying, how do I let him into my life? Well, I'm going to lead in a short, simple prayer that you've got to say, most of all, meaning in your heart. If you want to accept Yeshua for the first time, if you don't know where you're going to live a thousand years from now, let me tell you where I'm going to be living. I'm going to be living in the Father's house. The way you get there is through Messiah and following his example. So if you want to live there in peace and prosperity and live forever and drink from the water of life freely and say these words after me. Say, Yeshua, today I ask for your forgiveness. I ask for your blessings to be upon my life. I've done many things wrong and today I ask for that forgiveness. I ask you to wash me, clean me, make me something new. You've done that for the very first time. You are born again. But Yeshua said this, you don't profess him before man, he cannot, will not profess you before his Father and his angels. So if you've said that prayer for the very first time and meant it in your heart and your spirit, and lift up your hand if you're in the sanctuary, you're hearing this on radio, television, or internet, it says no so we can pray with you. In your name is Yeshua, and everybody said, Amen. Yevarekakah Yehovah, Purish Marei Heiha, Yeh Yehovah, Panavoleka Vikuneka, Isa Yehovah, Panavoleka Vyasem Laka, Shalom. May Yehovah bless you and keep you. May Yehovah make his face shine on you and show you his favor. May Yehovah lift up his face toward you and give you his shalom. Life, fullness, and peace. B'shem Yeshua Mashiach, the Lord HaLam, light of the world, and everybody said, Amen. Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Shalom. 
This is Messianic Rabbi Andrew Dinnerman. I would personally like to thank you for tuning in to The Remnant's Call each and every week. You can listen to the full message on our website, bethgoyim.org. If you have drawn closer to the King of Kings, learned more about Him today, we are blessed. If you are blessed by these messages, please consider a donation to our ministry. You can go to our website, bethgoyim.org. That's B-E-T-H-G-O-Y-I-M dot org. And click on the donate button. You do not have to have a PayPal account to donate. All you need is a debit card. Once again, thank you very much for listening to The Remnant's Call. If you have not taken your first steps to be born again, just ask God's help. Remember, it's His loving grace that has come to find you. No one is worthy or able to reach God, but God can reach us, and He's reaching out to you now. Just open your heart and let Him in. His arms are open, and the blessing of salvation and eternal life are waiting for you. Don't let it wait any longer. you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious unto you and give you his shalom. Shalom. My name is Messianic Rabbi Andrew Dinnerman and I invite you to come to visit our congregation. If you are in the tri-state area, come out and visit with us on Shabbat. We are a congregation of Jews and Gentiles living as one in the Messiah Yeshua. BGMC is a place of true worship. The focus never wanders from the Hebraic roots of our faith. Beth Goyim is rooted in the Word of God from Bereshit through to the book of Revelation. Messiah's strong words against man-made tradition are carefully recorded in Matthew 7. That is the reason we only follow the straight-up instructions found in Scripture. Truly, the way, the truth, and the life. If you're looking for a deeper walk with Adonai, come out for our Tuesday evening Bible study called Messianic Torah Time. Come, spend the day with us on any Shabbat. We start at 11 a.m. with the sound of the ancient Hebrew shofar. Next, we offer our King praise and worship in English, Hebrew, and Spanish. After worship, we review the headlines in the previous week's news from around the globe, especially News from the Holy Land, Israel. We don't just list the news headlines as current events, but we comb through the scriptures searching for clues to understand what they mean and then to help pinpoint prophetically our current position on Adonai's clock. After digesting all that modern information, we leave the world behind as we journey with our Adonai deep into his eternal word, not with just one or two scriptures, but usually seven or more scriptures. The spiritual nourishment and the richness of his kingdom become accessible to the ones who share this special time and seek them out. The day does not end there. Because Shabbat is so special to him, there is always so much more that our king desires to share. So instead of separating and leaving, we stay together as a family for potluck lunch and an afternoon study of our king's word. We close this Shabbat together with the reading of the New Week's parasha, That's the Torah portion. Even after those blessings, many of us just can't get enough. So the members bring prepared homemade foods to share while we all enjoy an uplifting movie together. If all that information is not quite enough, you can check out our website where you will find over 200 video teachings and Biblical Holy Day studies. Under Messianic Torah Time, the Hebrew Roots button, you'll discover free studies on many, many different topics. 
including PowerPoint slide presentations. If Beth Goim sounds like a place you'd love to visit, but you live outside the tri-state area, there is still a way to connect with us. We stream live on the internet on Tuesday, Thursday, and Shabbat. The website is www.bethgoim.org. That's B-E-T-H-G-O-Y-I-M.org. Our phone number is 973-338-7800 or 978-2-YESHUA. That's 978, the number 2, YESHUA. Shalom.